Hello and welcome back to my bookish channel. Um, I got a nice request the other day in one of the comments um, to talk about short story collections, my favourite short story collections. And I've got loads of them, it turns out. They're everywhere. And to me, they're not just the books that you have read cover to cover over the years. They're the books that you've had for years and years and you've dipped into. And maybe there's still stories left that you haven't explored yet. Short stories are kind of, um, to me, they're like emergency kits or uh, treasure troves that you go back to. Some, of course, you have read cover to cover, and uh, it's a joy to go back and rediscover stories or to, uh, to, to see them again like old friends. And uh, sometimes it's good to have forgotten things and go back to them and have that sense of walking on uh, your own memories, the kind of deja vu of short stories. Anyway, I'll go through a whole heap of them that are on my shelves all the time and ready to, um, <clears throat> to, be, de to, to be rediscovered. This is a collection from 1989, <clears throat> The Further Adventures of Batman. By, edited by Martin H. Greenberg. This was something that came out in this country in the summer that the Michael Keaton, Tim Burton, Batman movie came out. And we were on holiday in Carlisle when the movie came out and spent a whole uh, afternoon of, of, of holiday queuing for and seeing this movie. And I remember this book being out and, and just loving these stories because they were so much darker. And they're written by kind of interesting science fiction and fantasy people like Robert Sheckley, like Robert Silverberg and Isaac Asimov and William F. Nolan, who wrote Logan's Run, kind of properly slumming it <laughs> by writing um, Batman stories. I don't believe in that business of slumming it. I think these are people who obviously love um, the whole superhero thing, love Batman, uh, and, and put together this marvellous collection. Now, years later I became aware that there were sequels that I didn't get at the time, um, including The Further Adventures of the Joker, same editor, lots of the same authors. This was in very kind of recent times that I got hold of this. They're quite dear on eBay and such. Um, I think it's all the same writers, really. Sherry Tepper, I noticed, and uh, there's... A few other familiar names, but yeah, Elizabeth Hand, great collections, and there were further ones. I love superheroes and comic characters appearing in prose fiction. I think there's um, there should be more of that. Right, what else? Science fiction collections. Now, these are a kind of subset of uh, collector madness. This is Harry Harrison's collection, Nova One. I've got three volumes of this. I read this in 2018. This was from the very early 70s, 75 in this country. And again, it's Robert Silverberg, it's Ray Bradbury, it's Aldous, Gene Wolfe, um, lots of the names, Piers Anthony, that you'd recognise from the 70s. But they're great covers as well. Nova 2 and Nova 3. Harry Harrison was clever because he had a lovely sense of humour. Robert Sheckley, Aldis, Norman Spinrad, Philip Jose Farmer, lots of favourites. Print quite small. <laughs> uh, that's them. This is a fantastic collection. I'm sure I've banged on about this on this channel already. Constellations, Stories of the Future, edited by Malcolm Edwards for Puffin in the early 80s and it's just an unspeakably good collection there's one story that lets it down for me one out of all of them is not bad usually there's a few uh, uh, stories to let down any anthology but this is absolutely smashing and you know it, it really does reflect a breadth of types of science fiction in one book it's properly mind spinning now, uh, more science fiction. 
Jen Green and Sarah Lefanu, editing Dispatches from the Frontiers of the Female Mind, Women's Press Science Fiction in, I think, the 80s. This is a classic, uh, 85. Gwyneth Jones, who I read with once and was very, very nice uh, and gave me a quote for a novel. We read in Oxfam together, I think, in about 2000 and something, early 2000s. She was really nice. Uh, who else? Josephine Saxton, Joanna Russ, Kenneth Lee, Mary Gentle, Lisa Tuttle, who's fantastic as well. She once um, uh, commissioned me to write a short story for a collection about... Uh, it was erotic science fantasy spooky stories. This is in the mid-90s. I was more than happy to write a story for her collection. Here's the cat. This is another mind-bending collection. Some of them are completely, to me, incomprehensible. And uh, some of them are bonkers, and some of them are just wonderful. And I love the fact that it exists, and I have a copy of it. Frighteners. This isn't science fiction, it's horror. Mary Danby, who I've gone on about before. She was one of the great anthologists of the 70s. She did the Fontana books of horror. She did books for... Armada for kids, ghost stories. Frighteners was for adults. Socks, your feet are filthy. Thanks a lot. <laughs> uh, this isn't for kids. It's spooky stories published by Fontana. And as I remember, they were very disturbing. Lots of the names you'll remember, you'll... you'll uh, recognize from other collections. I'm looking to see if she's got a story of her own. But no, usually she'd have very kind of modestly her own story at the end of the book. Um, not this time. Frighteners 2. Lots of eyeballs and insects climbing into them. That was a big thing in the 70s. This is 76. Roger Mallison. Now, I've talked about him before and how that's a pen name for a writing team of two women who wrote under other names as well, and everything they published was great. Yep, another. Oh, Catherine Gleason, I think, was one of them. Or at least another pen name for the same writing, writing partnership. What a great thing to have. A completely gender fluid <laughs> writing partnership where you can write in any genre. Your to be genre fluid is uh, is the best thing of all. I think. Wow, I think I'm gonna say that's what I am. I'm genre fluid. That's how I can write as Elsie Mason some of my time. And other times I can be Doctor Who. Right. Beaver Books published Space One and Space Two by. Richard Davis, edited by. This is an interesting mix because it's 60s people, really. Moorcock, Clifford Simak, James Blish, E.C. Tubb. It reaches back into a kind of pre-New Worlds science fiction and looks ahead. Ray Bradbury, Aldis, Basil Copper. And it's got some of those kind of slightly horror-ish people published in kids' books in the 70s. And I remember these being fantastic as well. Very much based in the experience of people. That's what I think British editors of science fiction collections were keen on. I think, I think, ordinary people. They like banality as a, a counterbalance, I suppose, to the, the more outlandish aspects of science fiction and fantasy. I think that's what makes British sci-fi particular. Speaking of which, here's an 80s collection edited by Christopher Eb Evans and Robert Holstock. I've talked about this before, I know. Other Edens, which was, a, I hate the phrase, but a game changer for me in the 80s. When I was at college and this came out, 295 <coughs> cheap at 10 times the price. Lots of interesting people at interesting points in their career. Robert Holstock, Aldis, uh, Tanith Lee, and Gary Kilworth, who in this writes one of my favourite stories ever, Hogfoot Wright and Bird Hands. 
but the old woman who is chopped up to create pets for herself is a um, very Lisa Tuttle again, very spooky story. Other Edens 2, which came out the next year. I think they came out all the way through my first degree at university. During which I had so much to read because of the course I was doing. Um, but I read so many other things that weren't attached to the course, of course. Other Edens 3. And science fiction and genre fiction had no part in the English degree that I did or in the creative writing degrees that I did afterwards which was always a shame. I always thought for those courses you needed to be telling people about other genres and how to work in them. Now here's a classic, wonderful collection. Uh, this, the Penguin Science Fiction Omnibus, edited by Brian Aldiss. Now it would have been, it came out in three volumes to start with. It was Penguin science fiction in 1961, more penguin science fiction in 1963, and then yet more penguin science fiction in 1964, and everything in this, as I remember, was smashing. Lovely mix. You've got John Steinbeck alongside Ballard, and Frederick Pohl and Robert Sheckley, Asimov, James Blish. Yep. Really lovely stuff. And again, spanning all aspects of the genre. What else? I'm not going about all this too long. <laughs> uh, now, here's a collection. Oh, a proper school library collection, Cold Feet. An anthology of scary stories. We seemed to be blessed when I was a kid with lots of really nicely made anthologies that contain new stuff. You'd have a bit of old, a bit of M.R. James or whatever, and then you'd have brand new, newly commissioned stories. This is com compiled by Gene Richardson. And the people in it are um, smashing Alison Prince, who wrote the Joe annual and the Joe TV show I was talking about before. Robert Westall, who's always worth reading. Same with Joe Nakin. I haven't read this one yet. I've dipped into it. It was a gift. Somebody had found this. Um, and I've read most of it, though, actually, thinking about it. It's just nice to have things you haven't explored yet. There's still parts of the past to go into. Now, here's something I've read multiple times. The, I haven't got the cover. The cover is amazing. It's a great monster. Uh, the John Pertwee Book of Monsters. After his stint as Doctor Who, a number of years afterwards, he um, put his name to, I don't believe he would have done any work, <laughs> to a collection of short stories. And here's Roger Mallison again, retelling The Lambton Worm. Maybe the first time I read it properly as a... Uh, as a kind of proper prose story. It, it had been in the Usborne book of legends or monsters or whatever. Um, this is a a nice retelling uh, introduced by you know purportedly John Pertwee with my next foray into monster country I have to rely on hearsay even the doctor would find it hard to visit the realms of folklore and mythology which is funny isn't it because I've just had him do that that very doctor in uh, Josephine and the Argonauts Lambton and the Lambton worm story means a lot to me because it's in the northeast, it's uh, near Chesterley Street, very near where I uh, was born and grew up. And it's the great story, isn't it, of the uh, the knight who comes back from the Crusades and finds that the uh, the worm that he threw down a well has become this hideous monster who's eating everybody, and he's got to go and do battle with it. Right, two of these. I've got another one somewhere. These are Scholastic um, hardcovers from the early 90s. Haunting Christmas Tales and Mysterious Christmas Tales. Somewhere there's Chilling Christmas Tales. These were the people who uh, wrote the British point horror stories. And, well, these are all ticked off as good. <laughs> um, and they're all brilliant writers. 
Susan Price, I noticed there. Robert Swindles. Gary Kilworth again, you see, who crossed over into doing kids' fiction. Robert Swindles is always worth reading too. Um, that's a brilliant cover on this one. Look at that, that kind of Herm the Hunter figure with the feral looking reindeer outside and the Christmas tree indoors. These are proper spooky, all the same people actually, plus Adele Geras. Hunter's Hall is the one about the kind of pagan rites and the Viking stuff. Yep. I can't remember what my favourite one is. I shall have to read them all over again to find out. Uh, it's not worth waiting till Christmas. <clears throat> I always pretend that I'm just going to read Christmas books at Christmas, but uh, they always... Um, get read at other times of year. They're even nicer at other times of year. This is The Secret Woman, a uh, Virago collection, uh, edited by Lynn Knight in, I think, the early 2000s. Now, these kinds of books were once ten a penny. Virago would put out these collections that would range from Colette to Angela Carter, and this does exactly that. And they always drop in fantastic people as well uh, that, you, that are less known perhaps. And um, in this one contains a Nell Dunn story that I'd forgotten about, a Grace Paley story, and Leonora Carrington, Jane Bowles, and one of my favourites, Elizabeth Taylor, not, of course, the movie actress, the 1950s short story writer and novelist who I should talk at length about, but I won't today. Um, so that's something that isn't genre fiction for once. Fantasy Stories, edited by Diana Wynne-Jones uh, from the 90s, I think. It was, this is repackaged in the 90s. Now, what's great about this is that it contains excerpts, and the excerpts that she chooses are some of my favourite. It's got the episode with um, The Flight of the Gump, from The Land of Oz, the first sequel to The Wizard of Oz. It's got some very odd bits and pieces. Um, and bits from Tove Janssen and Joan Aiken and C.S. Lewis. And they're illustrated all by the same person. So it's it's got a kind of uniformity to it that's very pleasing. A nice collection for going away with, I would I would say. You know, if you're going on holiday and wanted a bit of lots of different books. And here's the science fiction equivalent. Also published by, actually it's King Fisher. Oh, did both. And this is Edward Blishen chose these. It's a fantastic cover. Again, from a time when they let books be more tacky looking. <laughs> more um, pulpy and exciting looking. Everything has to be so tasteful these days. It's painful. This is great, and it begins with Nicholas Fisk, who I think, unfortunately, isn't well remembered now, but to especially boys of my age, maybe that's being sexist, science fiction readers of my age would read his slim, uh, child-centred science fiction books like Space Hostages and Time Trap and Robot Revolt. Uh, they were set in a very recognisable Britain of the 60s and 70s and take science fiction ideas and just go wild with them for 100 pages. John Christopher, uh, Arthur C. Clarke. There's a lovely excerpt from The Tripods by John Christopher. And Ray Bradbury. And I think there's a story somewhere by, I can't see it. Uh, maybe it's a different book I'm thinking of, really. Oh, Stephen David, who is included with that story in one of the Peter Davison books of Alien Planets, which I haven't got on this pile, but again, another favourite of the era, where they took a Doctor Who, put him on the cover, and then had him introduce short stories. This is a, this, the, the Marks and Spencer's book of fantasy and imagination. Imagine that St. Michael book. Magic carpets, talking animals, witches, goblins, and ghosts. And it's bits of books 
they did a science fiction one as well that I've got somewhere and have lost. And again, they had their own illustrations for things that you knew well. So in this in this space one, their drawings for Doctor Who and Star Wars were kind of from memory rather than photo reference, which was much more entertaining than the usual, you know, slavish devotion to detail that these things have. Yeah, this is all great. Kind of bits of the borrowers, bits of Doctor Doolittle and the Phoenix and the Carpet and the Phantom Toll Booth. Lots of them are favourite moments. The Lion and the Unicorn from Alice Through the Looking Glass. See, they're well chosen. They're not obvious. Maybe that's the thing. Not being obvious, that's what I like. <laughs> it does pick out the same bit of, uh, I believe, <laughs> of uh, the marvellous Land of Oz. It must be everybody's favourite bit then, the bit with the gump, where they tie together two settees and give it a moose's head and it flies through the air. Of course that would be everybody's favourite part. Yeah, the illustrations are good. Look at these from Alice. You know, it's so hard to think of Alice as being anything other than Tenniel, that I always admire it when people can give something uh, a new look. Now, this is Out of This World, which was a numbered collection. Uh, this is a choice. It says Out of This World 2 and 5. They've put together two of them, quite oddly. Quite long short stories, and they're people like Jack Vance and Brian Aldiss. And I remember this being marvellous. Somebody sent me these. Uh, I think they're ex-library copies and absolute treasure. The kind of thing that would be put in the library sale and... When it's gone, it's gone. Nobody's bringing these back. And they're just nice, chunky collections. The kind you would take out at the beginning of a holiday. Look at those aliens on the front. I love them. And out of this world, uh, which number is this? Three and four. See, that's more sensible. What's this? Two and five, three and four. I love the eccentricity of that. And a cover drawn in felt tips. That's so bold. <laughs> John Wyndham, Arthur C. Clarke, Aldis, J.G. Ballard. These look so familiar from the kinds of things we'd have in, in school or in our town library. Yep. I haven't completely read those. I've dipped into them. And I remember reading them during lockdown, actually. One of the things I did in lockdown was dipped into lots of books. I remember spending days uh, devising ways to read bits of books. Fantasy Tales. This is the last one I'm going to talk about for now. Barbara Ierson, who I've talked about a lot in her horror collections. This is this includes the star beast by nicholas stewart gray and he's someone that um i'll talk about some other time but he was fantastic and i've got a few things by him dotted throughout other books somebody somebody worth looking for again but that's a lovely collection everything in it she also edited and it's here somewhere a collection of time travel stories and every single one of them is fantastic again a rarity really that that ever happens but i see that i'm running out of time and i want this to be not too long <laughs> so socks is waving goodbye he's not really he's just sitting there um but we will see you soon please like and subscribe and leave comments and tell us about what anthologies you've kept over the years and the books you've returned to and the collections that you um are still very slowly reading. I think um, there are very stabilizing things to have in your collection. I think that's what short stories are, those kind of collections. Um, familiar and unknown at the same time. Okay, I'll stop blethering. See you again in the next episode. Goodbye. <laughs>